control of the internal environment. Now hopefully this video turns out I guess a little bit better than chapter one. Uh, I did cut off a little bit on the top of the slides so hopefully I don't do that this time when I I'm actually using a QuickTime recorder to do a, a screenshot of this uh, and when I cropped out of what to actually record on the screen I, um, I it was essentially a different aspect ratio than what the video is so hopefully I got it good this time uh, anyway so we'll continue on So the homeostasis, or the dynamic constancy, is how the book describes it. So homeostasis is simply a constant internal environment. Our bodies are constantly trying to maintain homeostasis, trying to maintain a certain level of consistency within the body. And we try to get to this steady state uh, like we talked about um, in chapter one, when we <clears throat> when we talked about um, uh, the the last part, getting into a steady state exercise to be able to figure out your VO2 uh, and your carbon dioxide production as well. So any physiological variable uh, is going to remain relatively unchanged during this steady state. And it can take up to a few minutes or, or even a, a few hours as well. And some of the mo more common variables that we'll look at is heart rate, VO2, your blood pressure, also your core body temperature. A lot of environmental um, research, you're starting to look at what is the core body temperature doing and is it remaining constant? Is it increasing or decreasing? or in certain activities in certain environments. And then uh, there's a balance between the body's demands placed on the body and the body's response to those demands. So if something happens where the body starts to become a little bit out of whack, one of, the, one of these variables starts to become a little bit high or low, the body will try to respond and either increase or decrease back to a normal level. All right, and it's a relative normal level. Now keep in mind too that it is a dynamic constant. It's not an absolute constant. All right, it's not going to re remain, you know, your body temperature is not going to remain at 98 degrees the entire time or try to get to 98 degrees the entire time. It's going to be fluctuating but that average should remain linear. Okay, and as we see in these two figures here, and these are straight out of the book, if we look at exercise time on the x-axis and body temperature or core temperature on the left in Celsius, we can see as exercise time increases the core temperature will increase, but at a certain point you're going to get this steady state of temperature, whereby it's not going to be increasing or decreasing significantly, and the average will stay uh, fairly linear. And the same thing with mean arterial pressure, which is, um, we'll probably, we might get into a little bit later on, uh, but basically your blood pressure. If you've seen mean arterial pressure before, it's a, it's an equation between your systolic and diastolic blood pressures. And they can increase or decrease, and they will fluctuate from minute to minute, uh, and also second to second as well. And the same thing with heart rate, but as long as you can get that linear average, then you're, you have reached a steady state. So looking at the control systems of the body, we have cellular and organ control systems. At the cellular level, 
the cells can regulate the protein breakdown and then also the synthesis that's occurring within the cells especially within muscle cells this is really important the energy utilization how much ATP is being brought in how much of different nutrients and that goes in the third one the nutrient storage and utilization how many uh, how much maybe glucose or carbohydrates are coming into the cell how much is going out how much fats are coming in uh, with the storage uh, especially within the muscle and the liver where the glycogen is stored how much of that is being broken down into smaller units into glucose so we can use for energy utilization and then we have the organ systems the biggest ones here would be the pulmonary and circulatory systems or the cardiopulmonary systems and this will help regulate the oxygen in the carbon dioxide within the blood so if you are exercising you're going to be producing a lot of carbon dioxide that carbon dioxide gets into the into the blood and goes back to the heart through the venous blood so it's deoxygenated and then it will hopefully get to the uh, lungs to where it can be um, extracted and then you can breathe it out you can exhale it out and you increase your breathing just by or you increase your breathing because you're creating more of that co2 within the body so you need to get rid of it and you also need to increase the oxygen content then you need to uh, replace the oxygen that's being used and essentially all the organs are going to help try to maintain homeostasis in one way or another Now here's a figure from the book, uh, and it's actually a really good figure. If you take a home thermostat, uh, the body works essentially the same way. If it gets too hot, if you have a uh, if you have a set point in your house at 20 degrees Celsius for your thermostat, okay, and it gets too hot, all right, that's going to cause a stimulus. That it's going to register it's 21 degrees Celsius it's a, getting a little bit too hot so then it sends the data to the thermostat the thermostat then looks at it and says well is that temperature too high or too low from where we had it set and in this case it's too high so therefore the turn the furnace is going to turn off and therefore the air will become cooler and get back down to 20 degrees Celsius. If it is too cold, the same thing's going to occur in that there's a stimulus and it senses that it's going below the set point. The thermostat then recognizes that it's too cold and then the furnace will turn on and therefore warm the room up. Now this is known as a negative feedback system, meaning that if something is too high or maybe too much of a concentration, it's going to turn off or slow down a system to bring it back down. Or if it's too cold in this case, or if it's too low, it's going to turn on or speed up a system to bring that concentration or that heat back up. So if we look at the biological control system, it's going to be comprised of a sensor or a receptor. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we go into environmental, in that the body has thermoreceptors all over the body. There's also baroreceptors for blood pressure and chemoreceptors for CO2 concentrations within the blood. And there's a control center usually this is going to be the brain there's other parts of the body that can be the control center but a lot of times it will be the brain in uh, especially in temperature regulation 
So this is where the response integration is. Is that concentration or is that temperature too high or too low? And what needs to happen then? Therefore, it can send a signal to the effectors or the, uh, the target organs to produce the effects. And again, this is known as a negative feedback system. And then if you, uh, if you read in chapter two, it also talks about gain of control. Uh, essentially, um, gain is the capability to correct disturbances. And there's some systems that are gonna be a little bit better at correcting the disturbances. The thermoregulatory system is pretty good at it. And also your cardiorespiratory system is pretty good at regulating the carbon dioxide levels within your blood as well. So if we look at this figure, it looks similar to the thermostat figure, but it is different. And this is actually adapted to thermo, thermo regulation within the body. So heat regulation, or core body temperature disturbances. So if it gets above normal, right above 37 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 98 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to cause a stimulus because the thermal receptors are going to sense that, send a signal to the control center within the brain. The brain's going to say, well, it's getting a little bit too hot for the body and we need to cool it down somehow. So it sends signals to the blood vessels, sweat glands, uh, and also the, the kidneys as well. And it doesn't um, mention that here, but the blood vessels will dilate sweat glands will increase secretion therefore you sweat and you're able to transfer that increase in body temperature to the ambient environment cooling the body off then if it gets too cold on a cold wintry day and you're starting to get goosebumps there's going to be a stimulus saying that it's too cold it sends a message to the brain the brain says it's getting too cold we need to warm up the body. So the blood vessels are going to constrict. And actually the blood vessels in the periphery, in the arms and the legs, and especially in the digits, on the hands and the feet, will not have as much blood flow to them as the core. So the blood will shift from the periphery to the core to warm up the internal organs, the vital organs, and then also the brain as well. The sweat glands are going to be inactive, and if it gets too cold, you will start to shiver, and that is simply the body's way of generating heat. So as we contract our muscles, we are generating heat, therefore that will also help increase core temperature. So this is all in a way to try to get to that steady state and homeostat homeostatic point of temperature. When we look at exercise in homeostasis, exercise can really throw some of these levels out of whack a little bit. Increase them, decrease them. If we look at pH, your pH levels can decrease during exercise uh, through a number of different uh, ways increase carbon dioxide concentrations also lactate concentrations and if you're using up a lot of oxygen or if you're in an environment that has a lot of maybe carbon monoxide you're not going to have a lot of oxygen getting to the cells so you need to try to correct for that as well and then we talked about core temperature as you exercise you're going to be increasing your core temperature creating heat, so you need to try to regulate that as well and try to maintain homeostasis. You're able to maintain it a little bit better during low to moderate exercises in a thermoneutral, normobaric, norm, normoxic conditions, and also normobaric, meaning that low uh, to moderate exercise, uh, you know, not high intensity, 
uh, thermo neutral meaning you know around that just average temperature uh, that you're accustomed to you know 70 75 degrees maybe 80 degrees depending on uh, what you're acclimated to normoxic conditions meaning around sea level uh, you know as long as you're not at a high altitude in a hypoxic condition or a low oxygen condition because uh, that can throw a lot of the con concentrations off fairly dramatically and also some of the pressures uh, as well. Now during high intensity exercise and especially in a hot environment your body has a really tough time of maintaining homeostasis uh, and then therefore you're going to fatigue a little bit quicker. However given a, a certain amount of time uh, you are able to acclimate or become accustomed to these uh, types of environments and especially at in high intense exercises and it usually will occur at the cellular level so the adaptation then uh, is going to be the change in the structure and the function of the cell or organism or organ system so this will improve the homeostatic ability and again if given time for adaptation and acclimation to a certain uh, hot environment it's going to be approximately 11 to 16 days on average all right you're gonna need at least a week and a half to two weeks in a um, you know a hotter environment than what you're already acclimated to you can't really become adapted to the cold uh, one of the adaptations to the cold actually is um, your ability to uh, generate heat through external means such as maybe creating fire, turning on a furnace, putting on more clothing. For a hypoxic condition you can become acclimated or acclimatized to it uh, and again that takes a couple weeks uh, usually two to three weeks actually for uh, hypoxia if you go to altitude. Uh, here in South Texas pretty much at sea level uh, if you were to go to um, Denver you know a mile high above sea level uh, it's gonna take you a few weeks to get accustomed to it to for your body to get accustomed to it. And again acclimation is just adaptations that occur within an extreme environment. Uh, it's also known as acclimatization Acclimation can be looked at as a couple different ways. Acclimation can be a short-term uh, adaptation. Uh, it can, it's also been used to describe uh, acclimation to maybe like a fake environment. If you go into a room and maybe it feels cold right right away, and then it, after you know 20 minutes, you start to feel comfortable. Uh, same thing if you get into a maybe a cold pool. Uh, go for a swim and it's maybe like 68 degrees and you're like oh it's not so bad once you're in for a little while that that would be acclimation it's not acclimatization all right so it's just a short-term adaptation acclimatization will be a long-term adaptation such as in that hot environment given a couple weeks or the hypoxic condition over a few weeks the last a couple things I want to talk about or I guess the last topic I want to talk about in this chapter is the cell signaling. Um, we have a few different ones I believe five of them are here and they're right at the end of the chapter. So looking at them we got intracrine signaling. Uh, this is chemical messenger inside a cell that triggers a response inside that cell, that same cell. So if we actually look at the adrenal glands that are located on top of the kidneys there's a renin Angiotensin, angiotensin excuse me, cycle and what that does is renin will activate uh, angiotensinogen angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 in the adrenal glands and then that will also produce aldosterone for the kidneys so then the aldosterone helps the kidneys reabsorb more sodium. So and wherever water or wherever sodium goes, water also follows. So if you're reabsorbing the sodium within the kidneys and you're not excreting it, then you're not going to be excreting 
a lot of water as well. So it helps prevent dehydration. We have juxtacrine signaling. And these are chemical mess messengers uh, passed between connected cells. So it's like the intrinsic conduction of the heart. If you look at the heart and the way it contracts, there's a signal essentially goes from the top down to the bottom or the apex of the heart into the Purkinje fibers, which then uh, filter into the walls of the ventricles. So it goes from the SA node to the Purkinje fibers. Again, those cells are interconnected uh, down through the, actually it's the inner uh, interventricular septum uh, and it will travel down into the walls of the ventricles. So that's juxtacrine signaling. And the three other ones are, one is autocrine signaling. This is chemical messenger that acts on the same cell. So similar to intracrine signaling, went back real quick, let me go forward. All right, this is uh, like, some, an example of this would be protein synthesis and hypertrophy within the muscle cells. All right, you're gonna cause some damage when you're uh, exercising within the muscle cells, the good damage, the microscopic damage and you're going to increase uh, signaling for protein synthesis and then satellite cells then will help either um, increase the muscle cell size or it will possibly create another muscle cell either hypertrophy which is increasing the size or hyperplasia which is increasing the number of the cells then we have the paracrine uh, paracrine cells, but it should be paracrine signaling, excuse me. So chemical messengers that act on nearby cells, so they're not really connected, but they're uh, they're nearby one another. Uh, the clotting factors within the walls of the blood vessels is a good is a good example of these. So there's a signal that occurs within a blood vessel that's damaged, maybe has a rip or a tear in it, <clears throat> and there's going to be signaling that occurs to try to fix that and essentially mesh it up and create some type of structure to repair that rip or tear. So they act on nearby cells. And then endocrine signaling, uh, this is one that, uh, you know you hear about quite a bit, you know, like your endocrine system. These are chemical messengers released in the blood. So they're flowing throughout the circulatory system. Uh, the main difference with these ones compared to all the other ones is that there needs to be a receptor on a cell for that endocrine chemical to actually function. Uh, one good example of this would be insulin. If there's a cell that does not have an insulin receptor, insulin cannot act on that cell. And um, there's, there's a bunch of other ones, but insulin is uh, one of the main ones there. And we'll probably be talking about that uh, a little bit, uh, especially if we get into uh, exercise and maybe special populations and diseases when we talk about diabetes. So anyway, uh, that was it for chapter two. This is kind of a short one uh, <laughs> compared to chapter one. Uh, next uh, week, or I guess the next PowerPoints I'll be putting up is chapters three, four, and then I believe it's number eight as well. We're going to do muscle function. So we have biochemistry, bioenergetics, and then also muscle function coming up here. Um, so stay tuned. And uh, if you had any problems with any of these first two videos, please let me know. I'm going to, again, this is my first go around with uh, putting videos up online. So I kind of want to get your feedback, uh, either the audio, the video itself. Um, I'm hoping later in the semester uh, to get access to some uh, maybe higher tech equipment uh, but for right now I, uh, you know this is kind of the best I, um, I can do at the moment with the tools that I have so um, I'll try to work with you best I can so anyway uh, I will upload the other ones within the next week thank you